and then she shares it to Retro York. So you can see the two different places, Retro York Facebook group. And probably could share it to Adam, your uh, Facebook page. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I don't know. If I'm, I'm, I'm volunteering to call for something. But... <laughs> Is that, do you want that? Sure. Yeah, I could probably might be able to make that happen. You, you, you'll have some time. Yeah, yeah, while you're talking, yeah, I should be able to make, make that a reality. I'm just going up when you're ready. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Writer's Roundtable. Um, Adam's going to go on in about 15 minutes, so hang tight. If you're watching online, please feel free to get up, go get your dinner, get a hot drink, get ready for tonight's presentation. Um, we're going to have a little round robin if anyone wants to come up and talk about any projects that they're working on. We're going to give everyone a minute or two to share uh, our local historians. So does anyone want to say anything? Come on. Okay. Hi, I'm Stephen Smith. Uh, I do York's Past blog uh, this past summer. It's 10 years since I started it. Uh, Congratulations. 1,200 posts, so it averages about uh, 10 posts a month. Uh, unfortunately, I'm down to about four a month now because I'm prepping for three new talks in October. So that takes a lot of time. After I'm done with that, uh, I'll be doing a, an article for the journal. Uh, basically, the, the quest to properly honor George Wood, who is the only World War I veteran, uh, Black, from York County, uh, that died in action. So uh, that's what I'll be doing. Yeah, I'll go ahead and, uh, and coax folks to come up. I'm Jim McClure. And, uh, you know, uh, Rick, would you like to come up? Talk? Rick Rich. Hello, I'm uh, Richard Resch with the uh, West Mannheim Township Heritage Commission. And for about the last year, we've been working on the uh, research of uh, Peter Dix's Spring Forge Number no. 3 in Spring Road. We got involved in it early, late last year when uh, a landscaper in West Mannheim Township uh, was doing some work and came across some slag. And lo and behold, when somebody looked at it with the um, Owner of the property was from Penn, so it was a Peter Dix, which is probably his father. So we're trying to do a tie-in. We to date uh, the big discoveries we've made are one at uh, one point George Ross and Company owned both Mary Ann Furnace and Spring Forge number three. They were sold in the same agreement, uh, which was kind of me. The second thing we found is a plan just recently showing the location of Spring Forge number three and two buildings on the property in the mill race. And we still have trouble getting it oriented to where it is in the field today, but we're making progress on it and hopefully we'll be able to get some more information on Spring Forge number three. And then next year we're working back, on, we're getting back on Marianne first. Yes. When you say George Ross, like George Wash, signer of the Declaration yes, of Independence. Right. Okay. And, right. Yeah, I don't know if you heard, but that's that's George Ross. It's the Signer Declaration of Independence. So, you know, anybody else? Uh, uh, Jerry, you want to make uh, make a pitch, ladies and gentlemen? Jerry Jones. I never turned down that opportunity to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jerry Jones with Jones Geological Services, and uh, uh, just asked me to uh, plug my Ali programs this, this fall. I'm doing a uh, dinosaurs of Southeast Pennsylvania for Ali on September the 20th. And October 25th, we're going to talk about what's new up in the heavens, like the James Webb Telescope. But uh, some 
talk about George Ross. I just signed a uh, just signed a contract with Kedour State Park. We're going to do an archaeology week there next June. Uh, we, we were there in 2009 and 2010, but we want to go back in 2023 and uh, uh, do some further excavations and hopefully uh, get more information about where the furnace did sit. And also we're getting ready to rewrite uh, a gold in Southeast Pennsylvania book, more about actually York and Lancaster County. So uh, we're kind of staying busy here. So the dinosaur store will be uh, in Lancaster or Re where? Repeat Philly? the question. <laughs> uh, it's not really a tour. It's going to be a program I'm doing at Ollie, Penn State, York, about with the PowerPoint. Uh, oh, Penn State, York? Yeah, where, oh. the, where the dinosaurs lived in Southeast oh. Pennsylvania, which included York County. Yeah. Ollie is, uh, is, is a program at Penn State, York, OLLI, and they have a robust catalog. Uh, Jerry's a presenter there and, and others here that uh, if you go all the way at Penn State York, if you Google that, you'll you'll see the catalog. And uh, I think it's eight dollars for members and 20 for non-members, something like that. So uh, and you can see just in this, uh, this is one of the things we do at Writers Roundtable is we have we, we've talked about George Ross, three different interest points on George Ross. And so that's one of the things we do here is connect researchers. And just people that have interest in uh, in history. So, uh, Tom, any pitches? Tom Ying. Hi, I'm Tom Yingling with the Cadoras Valley Area Historical Society. We're located in Jefferson, south of Spring Grove. Um, basically, we have our monthly general meetings. Our next one will be on uh, September 13th, seven o'clock at 48 Baltimore Street, and we're going to have a Followed by the name of Ross Hetrick, he's going to portray uh, or portray Thaddeus Stevens. He does a nice job with that, and uh, so he's from he lives in Gettysburg, and there actually is a Thaddeus Stevens Society, and uh, he's he heads that up. But anyhow, he's going to be doing that. It's an interesting portrayal that he does. So uh, we we meet monthly, and also we have an open we're open to the public uh, every second Sunday. But one of the projects we're going to begin uh, actually we've just began this. I'm going to be working with uh, your college on this is a GIS project, Ge Geographic Information Systems, but uh, we're gonna be trying to identify um, log structures within the Cadoras Valley, which encompasses North Cadoras, Heidelberg, Cadoras, um, Mannheim, and Springfield Township. So uh, if you know any log structures there, let me know. And uh, we're, we're just trying to get those things documented, and then we're going to move on to stone structures and and brick and and on and quarries and just a bunch of other stuff, and put it on a map that will be available to the public just to see where these things are, so we can get a historic pers perspective perspective on on these locations. So that's yeah, great. And I know Tom is interested in George Ross as well. So uh, it's a common theme here tonight. Um, you know, any anybody else? Come on up, and anybody else want to pitch? Here, come up next. Hi, I'm Annette Portman from the Spring Grove Area Museum. I just want to mention that we have recently hired a, a executive director. Some of you know we're in a limited space right now, and, uh, always looking for a new place. Still haven't found a new place. So, in the meantime, we're trying to uh, bring everything more into a relatable way. In other words, when you have 4,000 square feet, now you're down to about 1,800 or less. You got to do something different. So that's what we're main project is now. I also wanted to mention, of course, that Tom is coming out to speak at our meet presentation meeting on the 20th of September, and we hold ours at uh, St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Spring Grove, 7 o'clock. Everybody's welcome. Also want to mention that on um, Scott Mangus is going to have a book signing on the 18th at our location which is right behind the Hardy's in Spring Grove at 100 Glanton View Drive. It, and it's in behind the car wash. So it's Hardy's, us, the car wash. We're all kind of right there in a row. So a lot of people go by and say, I don't see you, I don't see you. <laughs> but it used to be a computer store and a lot of people are familiar with having been a computer store. So thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, anybody else? Uh, Adam, come on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I've got a pitch. Uh, I'm also on the uh, the board for the His, uh, Historic Preservation Trust of Lancaster County, 
And we're having a preservation summit on Friday, September 30th. Uh, all uh, historical societies are welcome to attend. The, the, the afternoon evening program is for them uh, to attend. Uh, it's going to be at the Ware Center. I think we're going to have some free drinks as well. So think about, <laughs> think about coming for that reason. Uh, if you're at all interested over here on the table, I've got a little document about it and a QR code. You can scan it and registration is free. It's free to attend. Uh, we also have during the day for any municipalities that are interested in, in historic preservation as well. That was Adam Zern, and he'll be up in a few minutes and uh, to, to give the main presentation. Uh, Nicole? Nicole Smith from the uh, History Center. Good evening, everyone. It's great to see you all here tonight. Um, just want to welcome you. Thank you for coming. If for folks that are watching at home, and we have a few, please type any questions into the chat or comments on Facebook. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the York County History Center face, I'm sorry, YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube, put in York County History Center, you can see all of our previous programming. A couple things coming up. Our second Saturday speaker on September 10th is Guy Dunham. He'll be speaking on the Faith Presbyterian Church. September 21st is our Civil War Roundtable featuring our own Dominish Miller speaking about the history of the 87th Pennsylvania Regiment. Uh, we're having a book sale. It's uh, sort of like our old book blast, but it's going to be held September 29th through August 1st. And it's sponsored by the Friends of the York County History Center. And our next All Vets is September 28th, and our speaker is Jim Meyer. If you're interested in any of our programming, um, please visit yorkhistorycenter.org. Thank you. Now, Adam is so popular, Adam Zern, so popular that he's going to get two introductions. But <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to kind of set it up first. But, uh, and really, uh, this is really intentional to get Adam here uh, because I think there's a lot that could be done, a lot more that can be done to cross that river. And your county understand uh, Lancaster County history and Lancaster County understand your county's history and that and, and Adam his on his uh, published work and so on things he does online he kind of has beat both county and in the river itself so you know so I think we can do a lot more than that and there's a lot going on, on both sides of the river there's the I think your counties are increasingly going to the other side to uh, to go on the Enola low grade Trail and the Northwest Trail, the, the Columbia Crossing is is doing a, a great job. And on your county side, you, you see a lot more. There's a lot more attraction. The Helen Hills is going in. That's the Lancaster Conservancy is purchasing land along the uh, river, and that will be developed. You know, the uh, the Horn Farm is going to rebuild. That we have that to look forward to. Um, Wrightsville is doing a lot. The Wrightsville Borough is doing a lot on the riverfront. And there's a, there's a river run park there. I've never been there. Really recommend you, you go there. And then the uh, the um, York Heritage Re or the uh, I was getting the wrong Susquehanna Heritage uh, Region and you know is going to develop the Mifflin House and the Joint Underground Railroad Museum and uh, Welcome Center. So there's a lot developing on both sides of the river. Just recently, um, there's a joint presentation that Dominic uh, Miller is part of with, uh, uh, I'm gonna mispronounce his name, but we'll just say with, with Corey from Lidditz. And the two of them did a joint presentation on Lancaster and New York County history. So we see that this is kind of all coming together in a good way. And that's why we ask uh, Adam to come here tonight. So Dominic will finish the introduction. Yeah, like Jim said, we're really excited because the whole goal of Writers Roundtable is to bring historians from other cities and counties together, and Lancaster's our neighbor right across the river. So by day, Corey is a school teacher, or I'm sorry, Adam, <laughs> not Corey from Lit. Adam Zern is a school teacher, and then he also runs the Uncharted Lancaster Facebook page. So please, you know, tonight check out his Facebook page. He has a lot of great research on there, and he's doing great things for the community. So tonight he's going to give us a presentation. Of about Native American rock carvings and the river. So if you'd like to come on up. All 
All right. Hey, greetings. Greetings, everyone. Uh, I am thrilled to be here. Don, Jim, thank you for those, those kind introductions. Uh, my name is Adam Zern. I'm, I'm the man in the hat. I, I got to put it on so people know who I am. Uh, if I don't, I could, that's how I go incognito. I just take the hat off. Uh, but I'll, <laughs> I'll take it off here uh, while we're inside. But um, it is, it is, I'm thrilled to be here. It's always a, a real treat to cross the Susquehanna River and be able to, to speak to folks. Uh, and so, as, as we mentioned, I'm going to be talking about, so you're going to click it the right way. Maybe I'm clicking the wrong direction. Do I have it on? Is it even a phone? The down arrow. Oh, it's the down arrow. Yep, there we go. Thanks. Thank you. There we go. Rookie mistake. Uh, all right. And I'm here to talk about uh, Native American rock art and other uh, shared stories. And as Dom mentioned, I, uh, I run a, a website. You can find me online, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, uh, on the web. Just search Uncharted uh, Lancaster. And there, I, I like to do uh, two things. Uh, one, I like to highlight fa fascinating pieces of local history. And since I think tonight's unifying theme is the Susquehanna River, I've got some fun facts and, and a few shared stories that all involve uh, the river that I want to talk about. So one, the, the Susquehanna River is the oldest major river system in the world, uh, at least according to the Susquehanna River Keeper. Wikipedia has it in the, in the top five, but most experts put it at somewhere between 250 and 500 million years old. Just as kind of a, as a point of reference, the Nile, one of those cradle of civilization rivers is only uh, 30 million years old. It's even older than the Appalachian Mountains. So geologists, you'll think that the river was there and the mountains kind of pushed up uh, around the river. Uh, so it even predates uh, that. So uh, we got William Penn, Pennsylvania's founding father. And William Penn had this, this bold plan to build a, uh, a new Philadelphia, it will give us some air quotes, on the banks of the Susquehanna, north of Turkey Hill. And I always kind of, that's where the windmills are. So just, you know, north of that in an area known as Washington Borough, and he supposedly set aside uh, like 3,000 acres for this, you know, this new Philadelphia. Uh, and the port for this major new city was going to be at Safe Harbor. And I, I find it fa fascinating because people just seem to be continually drawn to this spot on the Susquehanna. Uh, so today it's the site uh, of a major hydroelectric dam. Uh, before that, it was uh, an ironworks. At one point, it produced something like one eighth of like all the steel in Pennsylvania uh, was right there. Uh, around that same time, we uh, had sort of the port of Lancaster, and, and I just love the chutzpah of the plan, but to basically turn Lancaster City into a port city. Forget the fact that we're 137 miles <laughs> from the ocean, we're going to make it happen. Uh, and so there was a canal system down the Conestoga from Lancaster to Safe Harbor, and then at which point you could catch the Susquehanna Tidewater Canal and, and go down. Uh, obviously, William Penn wanted to put a, a harbor in the same spot, and this is the same spot where these petroglyphs are that I'm going to be talking to tonight. So people have just been drawn to this spot for hundreds, and as we'll see, even thousands of years to this very spot on the river, and I, and I just find that fascinating. Uh, so this is a pretty solid plan, for at least on paper, for William Penn. Here's a 1688 map, and we can really see that New Philadelphia is nothing more than sort of a, a mirror image of what's going on in Philadelphia. So from the Atlantic, you're going to enter into the Delaware Bay and then go up the Delaware River, and you're in Philadelphia. So near that, we are from the Atlantic into the Chesapeake, up the Susquehanna River to you know this this new city that they'd like to do. It's even practically the same uh, latitude as, as Philadelphia. So the, the problem was uh, at least one of them was that William Penn didn't know fun fact number three about the Susquehanna, and that is it is at least commercially it's the longest unnavigable river in the United States. Uh, now perhaps if you'd listen to John Smith, John Smith maybe had a good idea about this as early as 1608. There's this famous map uh, of Virginia. I uh, was charting uh, the Chesapeake and he went up the Susquehanna uh, as far as an area that he dubbed as Smith Falls. Uh, and he wasn't able to get his boats any farther. It's rocky, it's shallow, There's there, the water's moving pretty quick. Uh, and so he dubs that area Smith Falls. People are like, where, where's that today? Well, that's kind of where the Conowingo Dam uh, is. And so that, you know, that, that plan obviously didn't, didn't work out so well. But I like to think in some parallel universe, there's, there's a new Philadelphia there on the, on the banks of the Susquehanna. 
Uh, but don't let these, you know, commercially unnavigable waters like lull you into some kind of false sense of security. Ice on the Susquehanna is a femme fatale. It is mysteriously beautiful and potentially dangerous. More than once, this naturally occurring phenomenon has had catastrophic effects on the Susquehanna Valley. The first recorded ice jam, uh, or ice jam flood on the river dates back to 1784. However, there was undoubtedly many more uh, long before this date. But a March 24th, 1865 article from the Lewisburg Chronicle details the event. And it says, on the 15th, the streams began to rise and the ice broken up on the huge masses, but the latter lodged on the shallow lands and formed dams. Everything that could be moved was afloat. 40 cattle were seen in one eddy at a single time. Horses, farms, fences, stacks of hay were swept down in the general destruction to be seen no more. The plain on which the village of Wolfsbury is built was covered with heaps of ice, which continued a great portion of the following summer. Of course, one of the worst ice jams to occur on the Susquehanna occurred in uh, the winter of 1904. This exceptionally cold winter froze the Susquehanna solid in two feet thick ice. The ice was so thick, local merchants were able to transport goods between Lancaster and York counties via horse-drawn freight wagons. When spring arrived, it brought its usual showers, but the giant frozen mass resisted the thawing rain only at first. However, when the uh, downpours eventually broke up the enormous ice sheet, it created gigantic ice flows that began moving downriver on the afternoon of March 8th. When it became snagged on the landscape, it instantly dammed the river. In some places, the water rose 10 feet in five minutes. Your Haven power plant and paper mill were completely destroyed, or pretty bad there. You can see a, a photo of that your Haven dam. The village of Collins along the Susquehanna River in Kanoi Township, just south of Bainbridge, was erased from the map. All that remained was a railroad control tower. It blocked the Conestoga at the mouth of Punishing Safe, uh, Punishing Safe Harbor Village. Many of the houses were then sold for scrap. In fact, the flooding there far exceeded the aftermath of Hurricane Agnes. However, it isn't water and ice that caused, in my opinion, one of the most historically significant events on the Susquehanna and likely changed the course of American history. It was instead a fire. By late June, 1863, the Confederate Army had invaded Pennsylvania. After capturing York, the rebels planned to take the state capital, uh, Harrisburg, and possibly even Philadelphia. To get there, they would need to cross the Susquehanna River at Wrightsville. On the Lancaster County side, Pennsylvania militiamen from Columbia vowed to block the Confederate advance. Union troops retreating from York joined them as did a company of black militiamen. When Confederate Brigadier General John Brown Gordon arrived on June 28th with approximately 1,800 troops, the Federals awaited in their entrenchments. The rebels opened up with artillery fire and the Union position quickly became untenable. The Federals decided to retreat to Columbia and blow up a section of the over mile long bridge behind them, denying rebels access to Lancaster County. The explosion failed to destroy the bridge, so the order was given to burn it. As Confederates uh, surged forward, the bridge erupted in flames. Gordon's men worked for hours to extinguish the blaze. They succeeded in keeping Wrightsville from going up in smoke, but the bridge financed by the First National Bank of Columbia was completely destroyed. <laughs> Gordon's uh, brigade was recalled to York the next day. The Pennsylvania militia had saved Lancaster County and set the stage for the three-day Battle of Gettysburg that would soon begin on July 1st. Experts consider Gettysburg the high water mark in the <laughs> south and the turning point of the war. It stopped the Confederate momentum in the Eastern theater and probably killed any chance of Europe intervening. It gave the Federals a badly needed victory and boosted Northern morale. So that's the kind of stuff that I like to kind of highlight on, on the history side. And so opposite that, I have uh, the adventure side. And, and so kind of as an incentive to go and visit some of the places that I've talked about, I've created uh, a series of kind of self-guided scavenger hunts. And if you can solve the clues and decipher the riddles, 
uh, there are hidden trinkets out in the woods for you to find. Uh, nothing too glamorous, uh, 3D printed medallions and plastic gold coins and fake gems and, and things like that. But uh, a lot of families enjoy doing it. And once they've done one, it's, it's only a matter of time uh, until they, they do typically all of them. Uh, though the last two years, I've been running an annual treasure hunt. And so last year, one lucky family walked away $1,500 uh, richer. And so over five weeks, I had 235 teams uh, kind of running all over Lancaster County. Uh, they, they, they visited about 10 different locations, solving clues, deciphering riddles uh, as they gathered up, you know, bits and pieces of the GPS coordinates where this, this treasure uh, was found. And uh, ultimately, uh, the winners walked away with this 27 pound treasure chest filled with $1,500 coins. So, you know, a true treasure in, uh, in every sense of, of the word. So I'm already busily gearing up for next uh, year's treasure hunt, and that will have people uh, exploring both Lancaster and uh, York County. So I thought this would be a great place just to kind of mention uh, that treasure hunt. And so people will be exploring areas uh, kind of along the Susquehanna and, and what I'm calling the uh, jewel of the Susquehanna. Uh, and there's kind of a sneak preview of what the treasure map uh, will look like, and that'll probably launch in uh, April of, of 2023. Uh, I'm doing that in connection with the uh, Historic Preservation Trust of, of Lancaster County, and they're, uh, we're using the profits uh, from that treasure hunt to help fund uh, their digital archiving project. So uh, where they're gearing up to do a, a massive archiving, so all those records will be available to the, uh, the general public, hopefully in a, in a year or so. So that kind of brings us to the, you know, the main point of tonight's presentation, which is the, uh, the mysterious petroglyphs of, uh, of Safe Harbor. And as Don mentioned, uh, I'm a school teacher, so I would be remiss not to do a quick vocab lesson. And so what exactly is a, is a petroglyph? And that is simply a uh, carving made in stone. And to, to see these petroglyphs, you need a, a very scientific, high-tech piece of equipment, and that is a damp sponge. And you take your damp sponge, and you wipe it on the rock uh, with the goal of making the raised areas wet and the carved areas keeping them dry. And it suddenly becomes very, very easy to, to see these images right there uh, on the rock. Uh, and so that's, that's always kind of a fun thing to do. And it's, when I go out, it's typically hot. So if you, if you mess it up, it's, it's gonna be dry again in like 30 seconds. So you can try again. Uh, so there's, uh, we'll see some one of them later. So one of the, the one questions people have is, so who, who made these? And we've got our list of like, you know, usual suspects uh, here in the area. We've got our uh, Lenape, we've got our Iroquois, we have uh, our Algonquins and, and even the, uh, the Susquehannocks. Uh, but in fact, it's a, a group of Native Americans most people aren't all that familiar with. And that is the, uh, the Shanks Ferry people or the, the Shanks Ferry culture. And the, the truth of the matter is we don't know what most Native American groups called themselves. We sometimes know what one group called the other group, uh, but not necessarily what they what they called themselves or just the names that you know the, the settlers in the in the area gave them. And so the reason we call them this is the first evidence of, of this of this culture was found in Shanks uh, Ferry. So uh, there, there's a map and kind of pinpoint not far from, from Safe Harbor Dam. And uh, they were found uh, in the late 1920s, early 30s. Donald Kadzow, uh, uh, an archaeologist from the state, and his team is doing all this archaeology work in the area as they are preparing and building Safe Harbor Dam, starting first in areas that are going to be flooded uh, by the dam and then slowly kind of moving their way uh, to higher ground because they have more time to, uh, to do that. And there they found uh, several things. They found uh, a burial site. Uh, you can see this photo and he has like two main books that he wrote uh, on the topic. You can find them on, on Amazon. Uh, I got this picture though. This is a scan of the original. Uh, so last spring I got access to the archives room at Safe Harbor uh, Dam. And so I have a friend and I, we, we're, we're trying to scan those. It's, it's actually a much larger project than I imagined and trying to bring in maybe Lancaster history or someone else to kind of to, to finish that work. But our goal is, you know, sort of digitizing their archives. So again, that's available to the general public and not just, you know, in a room uh, in, in, inside this dam that very few people have access to. But they found, uh, uh, you know, some human remains there. Uh, here's another photograph of some of the, the pottery they found in Shanksbury. Again, this image also uh, from the Safe Harbor Archives. Uh, they also found evidence of, uh, of longhouses. And so this is a photograph of a replica of one 
that you can visit in uh, Lancaster County at the Hans Her House. And for, for us, that's that's our oldest existing structure uh, there, the 1719 Hans Her House. And there on the site, they have this, this replica. But the uh, you can see there's some poles in the ground that kind of hold, hold the structure. And so uh, the, these people would carve a point, they would burn the end, make it harder, make it more rot resistant. And then they would stick these poles in the ground and you know fast forward you know hundreds and thousands of years later and uh, archaeologists can find you know the evidence of, of where these poles were in the ground. And so these were all things that they found there in uh, in, in Shanks Ferry. Here's sort of a map of where we where we think their their territory was and the circles where those where those petroglyphs are uh, in the in the area there. Uh, and the petroglyphs, specifically the ones I'll be talking about at Safe Harbor, about a, a mile away from Shanks Ferry, but but they definitely lived like all through all through that area. There was evidence later found at, at Safe Harbor and in other places. They had you know a bit of a territory and were in you know in that area for at least uh, four thousand years. So uh, they've been there for quite a while. If you wanted to visit Shanks Ferry, if you've ever been there, it's about a 45 minute drive. Uh, you mentioned Lancaster County earlier. Uh, they own it. It's, it's kind of one of their premier preserves. It's very popular in the spring. People come from all over to see the wildflowers there, but it's, it's always a great place to go and visit uh, anytime. But that's, again, where, where the first evidence of, of this Native American group was, was discovered. So how old are these things? Uh, there is an unsubstantiated story that uh, on one of William Penn's visits uh, here to Pennsylvania, he actually went and saw the petroglyphs, probably not the ones at Safe Harbor. Um, if I had to guess, I would think it'd be the ones closer to, you know, where he wanted his new Philadelphia to be in Washington Borough, which would have been Walnut Island. But a lot of people think it was probably at Ball Friar. Uh, down uh, where the kind of Wingo Dam is today. But uh, he visited and asked one of the chiefs, you know, how old are these and or who made them? And the chief responded by saying, uh, our grandfathers, grandfathers, grandfathers uh, made these. And so even in William Penn's time, uh, these petroglyphs were, were really old. Uh, the current estimate is that there are somewhere between 800 and a, and a thousand years old, uh, the carvings uh, on these rocks. So if you, you know, want to visit, uh, you know, the, the, the site, you can turn to your good friend Google and Google, you know, petroglyphs at Safe Harbor and uh, Google's kind enough to drop a pin right there on the Google map for you and tell you right where it is. Uh, and getting there uh, is a little bit of a challenge. Uh, you can't, people are always surprised, like, well, can I drive there? I'm like, well, I, not unless you got one of those duck boats, but uh, you're going to need a canoe or a kayak. Uh, it's not a place to take like your fiberglass uh, fishing boat or your pontoon boat. It's incredibly rocky. Uh, the water level does move around uh, during the course of the day. So sometimes there's a rock there. Sometimes there's not a rock there, kind of depending on that water level. But they're only accessible uh, by, by boat. But uh, Safe Harbor has a nice little canoe launch. I've done a series of guided kayak tours out to see the petroglyphs uh, this summer. I've got one more. In October, I've been teaming up with Kayak Lenko so people can rent the kayak from, uh, from them. And then I take them out on this, on this guided tour. But there's a nice little canoe launch there at Safe Harbor. And you know, it's, it seems like a relatively straight shot out to this island that uh, Google points out for you. And here I am on my maiden voyage to go and see these petroglyphs. Uh, this is several years ago. Uh, I'm really excited about going out and seeing them you know, firsthand with my own eyes. Uh, and so I, I get out to the island and, and guess what? There are no petroglyphs there. And uh, this has sort of been a recurring theme for me with Uncharted Lancaster. And, and I would imagine some of the other uh, historians and researchers here uh, had a similar experience. And that is the internet has no idea what it's talking about, uh, right? Like not a clue. And so Google's like, hey, the petroglyphs are right here. So I went right there and there's no petroglyphs. And I'm like, this looks nothing like any of the photos uh, that I've seen. So it took a little bit of work, but I eventually tracked him down. And this is where Little Indian Rock and, and Big Indian Rock are. And, uh, you know, that's where Google says they are. And they're, they're much further downstream, about a half mile uh, south uh, of the bridge. And, uh, you know, you get out there and especially with Little Indian Rock, the rocks all kind of look the same. Uh, they're about kind of the same size. And so, again, without kind of knowing what you're looking for, it can be a real, real challenge to find it. But it's, it's definitely uh, doable. And so people want to know, like, why, why here, why in this spot? So we don't know a lot about the, the Shanks Ferry people, uh, but if you were to kind of group Native Americans, we could kind of put them in two columns. We've got the Iroquois and we have 
the Algonquins. And the, and the Susquehannock seem to share a lot of similarities, the, the Shanksbury people, excuse me, seem to share a lot of similarities with the Algonquins. And so some things that we know about them when they do petroglyphs uh, is this. And so one, they put them in a place with a unique landscape feature. So the Susquehanna River is 444 miles long. So from Cooperstown, New York, all the way down to where it empties into the Chesapeake at Avenue to Grace. And so for most of that length of the, uh, the 444 miles, the river is pretty slow, it's really uh, lazy, and it drops about two to three feet per mile in elevation. All right, so for every mile it's going, it's going, it's dropping about two to three feet. That is until we get here to the lower Susquehanna. And so in those last 27 miles of the river, it drops 208 feet or about 7.75 feet per mile. So just kind of compare that. So about two and a half feet per mile to 7.75 feet per mile. So unique landscape feature, absolutely. In fact, uh, something like there's like a thousand uh, petroglyphs in that 27 mile stretch all along this massive elevation change. Now, most of them today are submerged because of these hydroelectric dams. And it's, and it's the two, it's that 208 foot drop is why we have these major hydroelectric dams uh, on the river, you know, taking advantage of that massive change in elevation. So just kind of starting from the south, we've got, you know, Conowingo, we've got Holtwood, we've got St. Harbor, and then we have uh, York, uh, York Haven. So, you know, special landscape feature, uh, absolutely. Uh, the, the other piece is uh, Algonquin style petroglyphs are typically in a place where you are simultaneously connected to the land, uh, water, and sky all at the same time. And when you get out there on this rock, you're about a half mile from the shore on either side. So connected to water, absolutely all around you. Uh, you're up on this rock. So there you are, you know, centered on, on this rock, especially big Indian rock, which really sticks up out. And but there you are up on the rock, up in the air. So, you know, simultaneously, you know, connected to, you know, water, land and sky all, all in that point. So what, what makes these, you know, this, these sites uh, so significant? And so all these petroglyphs here in the lower Susquehanna represent one of the two largest concentration of petroglyphs in the Northeastern United States. The other site being in, in Maine. And, and uh, there were sort of, there were like uh, three major, you know, concentrated sites. Two of them uh, are, are gone and submerged. And so all we really have left is, is kind of what we find here at uh, Safe Harbor with you know, Little Indian Rock and Big Indian Rock kind of being the premier ones. There's some other stones or, and rocks. They're a little less, less on them and a little harder to find. But these are kind of the two, kind of the two main uh, pieces there. Just take, turning our attention for a second to Little Indian Rock, it has the best panel of petroglyphs east of the Mississippi River. And it's right here between Lancaster and York County, which I think is really, really cool. Uh, so, you know, talking about Little Indian Rock, uh, here is a diagram again from Donald Kadzow, and uh, I've updated it to kind of show what modern uh, water levels at between, you know, at, in that area are. So it kind of highlighted the areas if you were to visit in the summer that you're going to find, you know, the rock uh, parts of it submerged. Just to kind of give you an idea, here's a photo of it before the dams. And so we've got two people on the rock, which is nice, gives you some scale there. And we can see just how much of it uh, is, is out of the water, as opposed to this, again, kind of that superimposed um, level there. Now, a lot of people, I know the river is really low, especially up by York Haven and further up, the river is really, really low. Uh, and so people so I often expect the river to be low in this area. But uh, Safe Harbor and Holtwood and Conowingo, uh, their federal license requires that they sort of maintain a recreational depth during uh, like the summer months. And so between Holtwood and Safe Harbor, that's about 180, uh, 168 and a half feet, give or take, you know, a, a foot or so, half a foot, uh, unless we've had like a significant amount of rain and they, and they need to drain that. So, uh, you know, almost in the summer, it's almost always going to be right around that, that depth and won't, it won't change much. In the winter and in spring and stuff, you know, that's a completely different story. So at least for most of the summer, the, the you know, these rocks are, you know, available to, to visit again, unless we've had, you know, some massive flooding and, and rain there. But Little India Rock is just completely covered in, in petroglyphs. And we've got tons of animal tracks. And so, for example, we've got uh, 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 these uh, turkey tracks here. And if you kind of look, you can see some of them are almost uh, like walking the line. Uh, we're not 
100% sure what these things mean. Uh, some people think perhaps they kind of point the direction to like some good turkey hunting ground. Like, hey, follow this trail and uh, you know, that line and you'll be able to find uh, some turkey to, to hunt there. There are deer tracks and this isn't how they were made, but it, they're, they're, the tracks are amazing the way they look. And it's almost as if a deer had walked in the mud and that had been fossilized. You know, that's the carving uh, that we're left with. So we've got these great uh, deer tracks on there. They also uh, serve as kind of a window to the past and we get an idea of animals that used to be here, uh, but aren't today. So uh, a bunch of elk tracks on there. And so again, to the untrained eye, you might just think it's a, a large deer, which is kind of what an elk is, but these much larger uh, you know, elk tracks there and we can see uh, several of them there as well. We've got some bear tracks and I, I guess you get some bear here in North County. Is that, yeah, uh, we don't get them too often in Lancaster unless they're like picking through the garbage. We did have one down uh, by Shanks Ferry and near my house in, in June. So that was, uh, that was exciting. My wife was, was not a fan um, of that potential, but I, I thought it was neat. Uh, he's, he's since moved out. But we, again, was, we had bear here, obviously in much greater numbers than we, uh, that we see today. And it's not just animal tracks. Uh, we also have, you know, human, human footprints there uh, that they've carved uh, onto the rock. And so that, that's always neat to see because it's foot and the toes and, and all that. And, you know, realize that these people are just like us, even though they were there uh, a thousand years ago. Uh, there's also some humanoid figures. And so we've got a variety of them. There's some, there's one of, of a gentleman holding a bow, which is, which is neat. Uh, we've got you know, the, this one here. He's got some big hands. And so do you just have big hands? Uh, is he carrying a package? Uh, is it just really hard to draw fingers uh, on a rock? You know, we're just, we're not sure, uh, you know, why, why the big hands, but nevertheless, this, this person seems to, to have them. Uh, we've got uh, a Manitou, which is a spiritual and fundamental life force. And, and uh, a lot of, some of these carvings, I think, are these indigenous groups trying to make sense of the natural world. Because when I look at that carving, and I think you'll be able to see it too, I see a comet. Or a, or a you know a meteor or a shooting star, and so you know what are these things, or what are these things that we're seeing in the sky? What does that mean? And so you know undoubtedly trying to attach uh, some meaning to them. And so when I look at that, I'm like, oh yeah, that's that's totally a comet, and I can see how you know it, it would inspire these groups, you know, in, in, in trying to make sense of, of these natural phenomenons that they're seeing and, and experiencing. Uh, this one's really curious. It's it's for a few reasons. One, it's, it's just sort of way off by itself uh, on the edge of, of Little Indian Rock. And, and there's been a couple ideas as to what it means. Uh, one of the early ones was perhaps it's an enclosure. Uh, so something like the Susquehannocks had with their palisades. But, but these far predate the Susquehannocks, so it's, it's probably not that. Other people think that perhaps it's uh, like some kind of buried or hidden cache, something that they that they've hidden. And, and you know, I love a good treasure hunting story, so I, I think that's that's kind of exciting. Uh, but odds are, it perhaps is uh, represents a, a great piece. So we're looking at a, a large bowl, and then maybe some of the things that they ate there. So uh, you know, I look at it, like I think I see a turkey track. I see sort of a squiggly line, which I wonder would be maybe an eel. Uh, I think maybe I see a deer track, so maybe some venison and, and some other things that perhaps they had uh, at this at this great uh, at this great feast. But you know, beyond that, we're not we're not really sure. Uh, the next couple here, uh, these two different groups that I'm going to show you, really kind of put to rest this idea that you know some people are like, yep, there's petroglyphs, yep, they're old, but maybe they don't mean anything. Like maybe it's just graffiti. Because what is a board? teenager do a thousand years ago. There's no Xbox, there's no iPhone, there's no internet. Uh, I have a teenager at home and I can only imagine some indigenous person back then like, dude, you were driving me crazy. Go somewhere else. Why don't you go out on the river and just pound on that rock for a while before I feed you to a bear? Uh, you know, so I, you know, I could, you know see, see that. Uh, but but th that's unlikely because one, uh, these are hugely time consuming to make. Uh, this uh, is a schist mica rock laced with uh, fluorite, and it is incredibly hard. And so it would take about 20 minutes to make a dime-sized impression in the rock. And so these two squiggly lines, uh, which definitely looks like a snake, is like seven, seven and a half feet long. It's like an inch and a half, two inches wide. You can see like each of those little dime-sized impressions as it kind of creates the snake. So a hugely, you know, labor-intensive just making this piece and, and the others 
that we see on there. And again, this is made by a group of people that you know spend a, a lot of their time just staying alive, hunting uh, and, and gathering, and they're doing some farming. Uh, you know, the three sisters, corn, squash, and beans, and and doing other things. So to invest this time uh, to make this, it has to mean something. It has to be important. So probably not just graffiti. But the really cool thing about this carving uh, is this: is those two squiggly lines line up with the equinox uh, sunrise. Uh, and so again, these are people that are you know, trying to make sense of the world. They, you know, trying to mark the passage of time. Uh, when you go out there, you're sort of in this beautiful viewing bowl. Remember, you're you know long before any kind of industrial revolution and, and artificial light. Uh, so incredibly dark. You have this beautiful place to view the night sky. You know, watch the sun come up, watch the sun set, and uh, you know. And here's one way to kind of mark the passage of time with the equinox. Then at a slightly different angle, we have a single squiggly line, definitely a snake. You can see that head, you can see that tail, uh, but that lines up with the uh, winter solstice sunrise and the summer solstice sunset. So another way for these, these people to kind of mark the passage of time, you know, maybe help them know when do we plant, when do we, uh, when do we harvest, when do we hunt this, when do we, you know, move locations, when do we set up, you know, summer camp, when are we going to set up our, our winter camp? So helping them, you know, mark uh, the passage of those times. So, you know, those, those two sets of carvings, like really kind of laid to rest that these are purposeful, uh, these carbons mean something, uh, and they are very important. Uh, there's another interesting one here, and uh, again, Paul, uh, Donald Kadzow talks about it in his book, and he thinks maybe it's a, a snake within an enclosure, and so you can kind of see his diagram drawing of it here, and, and I'm sort of pointing to it. Uh, there, it's a big one. It's it's hard to really get out there in pretty good uh, light. Uh, some people think maybe it's a turtle that it's conquered a snake, but you know, I look at it. And I think I actually think it's a snake devouring uh, a, a turtle. And so you know, I'm doing some reading and some research and, and reading different spots. And, and I come across this, these, these kind of these three points, and uh, I try and make this connection. So, so basically, interestingly, a group of the Delaware within the Algonquin linguistic family uh, had a turtle as their totem. And they've been called the turtle tribe by some authorities. So meanwhile, uh, the name given to the Iroquois well, the, uh, the Algonquin, and I, I can't pronounce it, but it ultimately it meant real ad adders or snakes. And so could this be detailing the defeat of the Delaware by the Iroquois beginning sometime before the 10th century, which would kind of line up when we, we think of kind of how old these, these carvings are. So maybe they're sort of marking some kind of major events in, in their life. And, and you know, this is something that's important that they're witnessed or that they've experienced and they're kind of putting it there on the rock and you know, kind of marking that as this major event for future people and generations to, to see that you know, this event took place. Uh, so just a little further downstream, maybe 75 to 100 yards downstream, we've got Big Indian Rock, and it really lives up to its name. It is a much, much larger rock than Little Indian Rock. Interestingly enough, there are far fewer carvings on it than Little Indian Rock, and they seem to be kind of clustered together in three spots. And so we've got a sort of a segment here, we've got a segment over here, and then there's several, uh, you know, that part's usually submerged, and this is kind of right on the water's edge. And depending uh, anywhere like six to 12 inches, these are underwater or, or not, kind of just depends on the day and, and what Safe Harbor Dam uh, is, is doing. But again, I sort of updated it to kind of show what's typically underwater on a normal recreational depth summer day there at, at Big Indian Rock. Uh, but this also has several carvings. There's a, a human footprint and there's my foot right next to it. Um, now we're a size 11 and, and it's practically the, the same size. Which I think is uh, which I think is really cool. Uh, again, this predates the Susquehannocks, but we talked. Uh, I mentioned uh, John Smith earlier, and uh, he talked about meeting these Susquehannocks, and he described them as as giants. Uh, and so some people are sure that these Susquehannocks must have been, you know, maybe maybe seven feet tall. Now, one John Smith, I think, really liked a good story, and like a, all fishermen, you know, that that fish gets a little bigger uh, over time. And I think that might have been a little bit there with the, uh, the Susquehannocks, but uh, most people think they were probably about six foot. Uh, I'm six foot. Uh, at the time, the average European is 5'4", so John Smith's coming in at 5'4", that's eight inches. So I have no doubt that you know, he's kind of looking up at the Susquehannock Indians that he's meeting. 
Uh, then we get into diet and you know, they're eating venison and, and, and good vegetables, corn, and beans and squash and, and fish. And, you know, so this wonderfully rich, healthy diet. Meanwhile, you've got, you know, uh, John Smith, who's just crossed the Atlantic and eating like sucking on what, lemons and eating hardtack on that boat. Uh, so I'm sure you've got two very physically, very different specimens there but between the two. So I'm sure from his perspective, those Susquehannocks were, were, uh, were giants there. Uh, we've got a variety of, of animals. It's the most of the documentation just kind of lists them as indeterminate. Uh, so here we've got a four-legged, long-tailed animal, maybe with some kind of long ears or or something. Uh, not sure what it is. Horses weren't here yet uh, when this is made. Uh, later, if you have some ideas, I'd, I'd be happy to hear what you think maybe that animal is. Um, here's another one. We saw this earlier. It's uh, it's about this long, maybe 18 to 24 inches long. So it's a good size. Again, this one's also kind of listed as indeterminate. I have a, a fox that lives near my house. I see him once or twice a month. And uh, a while back, I saw him kind of going across the road into the cornfield. And I was like, you know what? He carries his tail just like just like that carving does. I, I wonder I wonder if that's a fox. Uh, I wonder too. Again, that window in the past. If could we could we have an otter here that they're drawing on uh, a big Indian uh, rock? Both Little Indian Rock and Big Indian Rock have lots and lots of, of birds on it, or possibly even uh, thunderbirds. And so uh, we can kind of see. It's interesting. Big Indian Rock. The, the the bird is a little different. You can like almost see those feathers. And just the other day, I was at my house and I could see a turkey buzzard kind of flying around overhead. And I was like, oh, that's, that's kind of interesting. I can, I can really almost see between the feathers on, on his wing, a bit like the one on Big Indian Rock, as opposed to just one of the many on, uh, on Little Indian Rock. Uh, but some people think that perhaps these uh, represent, or some of them at least represent Thunderbirds. And so this is a uh, mythological creature. Uh, for the Native Americans, again, just trying to make sense of, of the world around them. And so this is a huge bird. It's a water bird. And when it takes off, that crack of its wings as it's taking off is the, is the thunder. And then that water spritzing off of its wings is, is the rain in your, in your thunderstorm. Uh, one of my recent visits out to the petroglyphs, there was a, we got a little too close, I guess, for this one duck and it's taking off. And as it's doing that, it's just a few inches above the river and its wings are just kind of like crack. Crack, crack as it's hitting the water and water is flying everywhere. And, and I'm just thinking, I can imagine, again, these people thinking like, you know, just imagine a much larger bird, you know, do, taking off and just sending, you know, these monstrous, thunderous, you know, cracks and waters, you know, flying everywhere, kind of creating this, you know, this horrible storm. You know, again, just these people kind of making sense of, of that natural world around them. Uh, this is with hands down my, my favorite carving. You've seen it several times. Uh, throughout the presentation. And, and I look at that and I'm like, that is a person in a canoe. And, and I think that's neat because that is exactly how I get out there to, to see these petroglyphs. I go out in a canoe, typically go out in a, in a kayak, uh, a little more forgiving when I hit a rock, which is like every time. Uh, and, and so I just think that's really neat because I'm like, wow, it's just how uh, those indigenous people are maybe getting out here to that rock uh, is in their, you know, their, their flotation device canoe. Uh, just like uh, I do now. Paul Nevin at Susquehanna National Heritage uh, believes that it might be a, a woman giving birth. And so those uh, are her legs. Uh, usually at that point, some of the women in the audience are like, no, no, my legs didn't look anything like that uh, when, I, <laughs> when I gave birth. Uh, but you know, I mean, Paul Nevin's the real expert on that. So I imagine he's, he's probably uh, correct on that. Uh, so uh, interesting enough, then just a short distance away, we've got uh, this very curious uh, carbon. We've got actually two of them there. And so there I am kind of wiping my, my you know, my high-tech wet sponge there uh, on that. And people look at that and they're like, is, is that ET? And, uh, and so what, what do we have there? And so there's the two of them. And so they've got like these alien uh, antennas. And, and I asked Paul Nevin like about it. And he said, well, he goes, I think they're medicine men. And, uh, and so if you Google, you know, medicine man, uh, you get some pictures and they actually fit relatively well. Uh, you know, they got some feathers there, and there's the one guy holding the stick, maybe similar to what the uh, what the one carving is, and it's near this woman maybe giving birth, so it definitely adds some you know credence to that uh, potential theory. But there's a there's another train of thought, school of thought on, on what this carving uh, might be, and I always enjoy a, a good yarn. So um, there are some people who think it might be a a wendigo, and that is uh, another Native American mythological creature, and uh, it hunts people. And, 
eats them. And uh, if you were to Google Wendigo, uh, these are some pictures that come up. It's uh, always hungry. Uh, the more it eats, the hungrier it gets. It's, it's emaciated, it's gaunt, uh, kind of has these elongated uh, limbs. It's sometimes described as having the head of a deer with, you know, with antlers. Um, again, some pictures don't have that. I don't know if there's like a male and female version of the Wendigo, or maybe it loses its antlers in the winter, uh, like, uh, like local deer uh, do, but you know, it kind of fits, fits that picture. And, and what I find interesting uh, about that is, uh, is this. And so just a short distance away, I was talking about Shanks Ferry, uh, where the first evidence of, of this group of people were found. And, and when you enter Shanks Ferry, there is this, this massive tunnel for the Enola Low Grade. Jim mentioned that earlier, and you kind of drive through this tunnel, the Enola Low Grade goes uh, above it. And uh, locally, this, this tunnel is believed to be haunted. Uh, and again, it's about a mile from the, from the petroglyphs. And so legend has it that this woman in white where this white angel haunts the, the tunnel and, and uh, you know, she met some tragic end there and, you know, her spirit forever haunts it. And, uh, and I've read a you know, bunch of stories about this or people go there and they smell weird things or they get weird sensations. Uh, one person said, you know, I ride my horse all over, been through tunnels before, my horse does not like uh, this tunnel, you know, and, and, and not sure why. But with all the stories, there, there's this one that kind of sticks out uh, for me. And so you, there's... Um, these two Millersville students, the state's back, the story's from the early 2000s, and uh, they go down to uh, Shanks Ferry, and it's his boy and his, and his girlfriend, and I think he's just trying to get lucky with his girl or something, but, you know, we, we drive, he said, you know, we drive down to the tunnel, and, and you're supposed to, like, park your car in there, the closer to midnight, the better, and then you're supposed to turn your car off, and you're supposed to walk around it three times, like a whole, whole thing you do, and uh, so, so, you know, we do the whole thing, and we get in our car, you know, and, and we wait, and, like, 10 minutes go by. And all of a sudden, this uh, like gangly creature kind of walks across uh, the center of the tunnel. Like, was it which my girlfriend screamed, start the car, start the car, start the car. And I start the car and I slam in reverse and we, and we fly out, out of there. And if you, if you drive there, it, it, this road has no winter maintenance. It's in pretty rough uh, shape. So I doubt their car uh, was in good shape after getting out of there. But they get out to the main road and, uh, and the girl says to her boyfriend, she goes, did you ever see the movie The, the Lord of the Rings? And he's like, yeah, that looked... That looked a lot like Gollum. And I'm thinking, you know, you, you didn't see Gollum. I think you saw a Wendigo. And you saw a Wendigo uh, about a mile away from the petroglyphs that perhaps have Wendigo carvings on them in the very same valley uh, where these Native Americans uh, were first found. And, uh, you know, we've, you've seen all these creatures that exist now or that one time uh, we used to see in the area. And so, you know, perhaps, uh, perhaps they know something that, that uh, we don't know uh, now, uh, but yeah, I don't. I just I do enjoy a good ghost story or something. So I always like to toss one uh, in there. Uh, but but more seriously, there um, the the really cool thing is when I when I go out there and I was just out there last Saturday taking a group of six out for a guided kayak tour. Uh, when I stand on those on Big Indian Rock and, and Little Indian Rock, I know for a fact people stood there, stood there a thousand years ago. And when I look west towards York County. Uh, the view hasn't changed. I, I don't like to think like it's still forested. There's no houses right there. There's no roads. There's no power lines. And I think I'm seeing the exact same thing the people who made these carvings saw a thousand years ago. And, you know, and in that moment, I feel connected to those people. And, and I'm an eternal optimist. And I like to think a thousand years from now, people will still come to that spot. Uh, and they'll be able to see these carvings and they'll be able to look west towards York County and it'll still be forest covered and there won't be houses right there or power lines. And they'll see the same thing that I'm seeing today. And in that moment, I'll be connected to those people in the future, just as I'm connected to those people in the past when I visit that spot. And I find that to be uh, magical and awe-inspiring and, and really humbling when I go there and, uh, and visit that location. Um, I'd like to, to thank you all for coming out tonight. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, over here, I've got um, some merch to pick up. I got stickers and magnets and some wooden nickels. Uh, I don't have any uh, York County, but I do have some Lancaster County maps made, made by York County resident William Wagner. Uh, this is his 1821 map of Lancaster County. It's the first uh, official map to show Lancaster in its iconic diamond shape as we recognize it today. Spelling, a little fluid then, just like it is today on Facebook. Uh, uh, Lampeter with an I, Welsh Mountain with a C instead of an S. 
uh, and some stuff like that. So I have some maps for sale for $10 uh, if you uh, are interested. Uh, if, if you don't already, I would love for you to follow Uncharted Lancaster on Facebook or Instagram. If you don't do social media, you can uh, get email uh, updates for my blog every time I publish a, uh, a, a new article. But uh, otherwise, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions or comments you have now or, or individually uh, afterwards. Yes, sir. Um, a couple of words. The first one was just a comment about the, the landmark and where the different pet scripts were found. Yes. And I think it lends credence to like, the idea that they would use them as sort of markers for like planting times and other like ways to interpret the landscape, especially when you were talking about like the significance of the locations in which they were placed. Right. So like if you have one that's placed like on a big rock that's not going to move, probably really helpful for like looking at how the like, sunset and the sunrise hit it determine like planting times and things like that. So that was a pretty cool um, thing to mention. Um, the other question I had was, um, had to do with the Shanksbury Tunnel. Um, yes. So the the Wendigo, um, that's, that's one possibility, but I was wondering if um, the Susquehannock Indians were around that region as well. Did you mention them earlier? They were definitely, I mean, there was, there was definitely evidence of them found at Safe Harbor, and that's like a mile and a half upstream. So okay. I would be, I'm sure there were Susquehannock uh, in that in that spot uh, as, as well. Because they have a legend um, of, of a similar, well, it's a slightly different creature but called the Abba Twitch, which actually- Oh yeah, the little, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love so the Abba Twitch. That, that um, maybe- He does kind of fit, you're right, he does. I hadn't thought of that, but it does kind of have an Alba Twitchy size and he doesn't have any antlers. Yeah, really weird, but I yeah. don't know what makes me think of that. So, uh, you know, for those who don't know, we got the little, you know, basically it's like, you know, your county, Lancaster County is like little Bigfoot, he's about four feet and he's kind of hairy and he likes apples. Uh, if you don't, you should go. I think it's in October, the Alba Twitch Festival in Columbia. Always a good time. Uh, there's a little haunted trolley ride you can do. You take you, Chris Vera takes you up in the up on the hill, and you can throw some apples into the woods. And uh, if I was him, I'd pay some kid some money to go sit down there and chuck the apples back. So that's what the, the Alba Twitch is supposed to do. Is throw? I would take a bite out and throw it back. I, that's what I would do. I'd pay some kids to do that all day. But that'd be great. But yeah, I like I like that the Alba Twitch. That's uh, that's great. I hadn't thought about that. So. That's interesting. Uh, any other questions or comments? On uh, Big Indian Island, uh, there's a big log on it. Is that from a flood? Yeah, so it's it's interesting uh, how they change. So uh, I, a lot, some of those pictures were from three summers ago. Okay. And, I, uh, and then I think there was one log on it. And then last summer, there were two logs perpendicular with it at the top. And then, and then another summer there was just one, but at an angle. So yeah, I, okay. so right now Little Indian Rock has actually got a bunch of logs on it. I went out this summer. I had my little handsaw with me. I'm like, I'm going to cut these little logs to, to get them off this this rock. And they were they were much much larger. I was like, I was woefully unprepared to remove them. So yeah, and I think those were probably from last September when we had the hurricane. Mm -hmm. um, so the water does the water does get high. Safe Harbor is not a fan of of dumping water, because from their perspective, they are just dumping free electricity right. down the river. But if, if we've got a lot of water, yeah, they've got to dump it. So the water, they, yeah, they do. Um, and, and Big Indian Rock's pretty high up. So that tells me, yeah, the water does get up there on occasion. Like, uh, I saw a hand here, yes. Yeah. Um, do you know if the width of the river has changed over time? Like, I was hiking one time and it's down the Mesa Dixon Trail, like, at one level, uh, yes, there's like some houses right there. Um, and I was talking to someone as I was walking, walking through there, and she had said, um, that her family members had lived in the area since before the, the dam, and that back then, before the dam, that the, there was basically like farmland out. I, I'm less so. The, the question is, is the river you know, is it higher now or is it wider than it used to be? And I, I don't know, I know less about the long level area, but I, I do know on the Lecture County side, we've got a railroad that runs along uh, the river. And that was, I don't know the exact year, but I have an 1864 Atlas of Lancaster County, no railroad. I have an 1875 Atlas of Lancaster County, railroad. So somewhere in there. And so what people, a lot of people don't realize when they put in Holtwood and then Safe Harbor, they had to raise, they had to move the, the train tracks up like something like 12 feet because the river is like 12 feet higher. It varies exactly where you are, at least in that area between like Holtwood and, and Safe Harbor, the, the water is higher. So they had to actually move the railroad up. So yeah, I would imagine um, it, it's higher and depending on the curve of the bank would be, would be, would be wider. I know you get, uh, I was taught uh, by Marietta and there's less and less 
dam effect, you know, because you kind of move beyond that there. But I, I'm less familiar with the long level area. But yeah, I know in some spots, yeah, the water is is higher. Um, there's some train wreckage you can see on the Lecture County side near uh, Drewmore. Looks like maybe it's a freight car in there, but some people think it might be the old railroad bridge that used to cross that spot. And then they just, it just, you know, as the water rose up, they flooded it out. Uh, I know Jim, uh, I think Mackie on the kind of Wingo Facebook page does a lot. Like the river's low and he loves to go out in his little boat and, and look for these things that were once submerged, but you know, it's been a pretty dry summer and they're, they're looking for neat things. Um, and, and one of the ferry crossings, he, he, he thinks the timbers are now visible in some spots, but you know, they're typically underwater. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, I would imagine yes to that. It, it has, it is higher than it used to be or wider than, you know, in spots than it used to be. Good question. Anyone else? Um, yes. I don't have a question, but I do know through a township down where Fishing Creek enters into the Susquehanna. Well, well, my grandfather moved there in 1915 from Lancaster, York County, that when the original railroad was down there, he and my dad would go down there and get fertilizer from a, a plant or a, a storehouse that was delivered there from the original railroad. So yes, it was one out and that if that's what you're talking about, like they see something, they think it's a railroad car, that is a bridge. Yeah, no, there's a yeah, I think there's a bridge, and then I think right below Susquehannock State Park is when the water is low, you can see a boxcar sitting in there. Um from an accident. And I know like I was watching, it's a great PBS special about the building of the Conowingo Dam. And it talks about like, some of these towns that just, you know, that were along the river that just kind of got flooded out and they were, you know, submerged because of the building of the of the dam there. So yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Good, good comment. Yes. Are campers in Susquehanna State Park or near there? Um so the there uh is Susquehanna or Susquehanna. So I, I don't believe there are any petroglyphs at Susquehanna State Park in Lancaster County. Uh, in Maryland, at Susquehanna State Park, supposedly yeah. at, at their Grist Museum, the, the bald friar petroglyphs that yeah. have been removed were, are on display there. I went three weekends ago and that place was locked up tight. So I don't, I don't know if they were, if they're just not open, like a lot of places seem to be closed down because of COVID or they can't find help to open. And, but then I realized the articles I was reading from like for 2015. So I need to e try and find someone to email to find them because I'd like to see them. Oh, but if you are interested in seeing petroglyphs but you don't feel like going out in the river, there's a couple spots you could go. You can go to the Conestoga Area Historical Society. They have, I believe, like four on display. They're open Saturdays and Sundays from one to four. You can go to the Blue Rock Cultural Center in uh, Washington Borough. They're only open monthly, but they have a few from Walnut Island on display. Uh, the State Museum has some on display. I, I was under the impression there's some at Susquehanna State Park. I haven't been able to get there. I think Seton Hall has some. I don't know why they do, but I, I read that they have some on display there. Uh, yeah, and um, so those are the spots that I know you could go and see without having to, you know, paddle out into the middle of the river. If you want it's a little less adventure, maybe a little more of a road trip, you could do that. Yes. Is there anything being done to protect these petroglyphs um, as you're doing these presentations and more people are becoming aware of them? I'm sure you're going to get some people who might not have the best of intentions going out there and doing their own little carving. Yeah, that's, you know, and so um, there's graffiti on there and, and it kind of raises an interesting question. At what point does graffiti becomes like historic? Uh, there, um, there's 1883 carvings on there. Uh, there's an eight, I think the oldest one that I can see is 1838. And I can see people a long time ago going, oh, wow, there's some neat carvings here. I'm going to add my mark to this. I've been to Wall Drug, I don't know if others have been there and everyone's kind of adding their sign about how many miles it is to get home. And I can sort of see that. Um, a couple of things like one, if you want to go out there, you got a lot of bad. Right. You really do. It's it's a paddle. Um, it can be, depending on the, it can be hard to get back to your car if you park in Safe Harbor. So that usually means a slogging down the Peckway to get out. Um, you, you've got to, you got to know where it, where it is. Luckily, they seem to be in, they've escaped modern stuff. Again, people seem to have a different opinion back in the day, like Little India Rock and Big India Rock both have remnants of uh, duck lines on them. Like people just put some, poured some concrete and put in a duck line back in the day, just again, just very different opinions 
on those things today. I, I'm talking to Paul Nevin, he said for a while, the idea was not to tell anyone. Don't tell anyone, don't tell people where they are. Uh, maybe that's the best way to protect them. Uh, but I, I, he said that, you know, they're changing, maybe thoughts on that are changing is, you know, if we tell people, more people appreciate it. And if they go, you know, and kind of respect, you know, and respect that that site when you're when you're out there and, and visiting them. But that, that, is a, that is a good question. Well, and then to piggyback off of that question, are they under any jurisdiction as far as like Lancaster County? Are they owned by anyone or is it right now just something? Yeah, great. So um, Lancaster County all owns all the Susquehanna River. So we are, so we're there. You're covered that in my yeah, Sorry about that. You were got it. I always, I, I usually leave that part out, uh, but I'm in Lancaster County. I'm like, yeah, we kept the river for ourselves. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have like 10 feet off the shore. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so um, I asked because I was there's a small tree growing out of Little Indian Rock, and, and I was talking to Paul Nevin. And I said, What are your thoughts on that little tree? I mean, little trees turn into big trees, and big trees like break rocks in half and stuff eventually. Like, I was like, What are your thoughts on removing that rock in, in preservation of it? And he, and he said, You know, and he'd had similar thoughts like about is it technically the, the state owns the bedrock. So the state owns, and that's bedrock and state owns the bedrock. But I get, I mean, it, it is in Lancaster County jurisdiction uh, to answer that. So is that, I guess to answer your question, I guess the, the state owns the rock and it's inside of Lancaster County. Yeah. So uh, there is a little visitor sign in book. I was, I didn't see it for a lot of summer, but I was like, I was out on Saturday and I saw this little book, they, you know, sign it. and. And they're trying to just how, how many people are coming out and, and get an idea of you know the traffic and, and and that kind of stuff going out there. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, yes, Jim. Um, I have understand that you're there's only certain types of shoes you're supposed to wear on the rocks, and also how uh, do you offer tours out there? Are there are there guided tours that people? There, offer there are, yeah, there's a couple a couple opportunities. Um, I guess to answer your first question, uh, I think the best policy is barefoot uh, on the rock uh, going out there, just trying to limit that wear and tear. Uh, I guess they made some plaster molds uh, of the rock back in the 30s, uh, and I think they're on display at Spanish National Heritage, and they've kind of measured the impressions now and the impressions then, and there's been like virtually no change, luckily. So the rock is really, really hard and seems impervious to, to a lot of natural uh, damage and are there tours? I, I did a couple this summer uh, with Kayak Lake. I have one more in October. Uh, we just we limit to six people just so people, it, you know, there's not a lot of foot traffic and, and just so people kind of get a, a personalized experience out there. I know Shanks Mayor offers uh, guided tours. You can you can go with them and they'll take you out. And uh, the Conestoga River Club, uh, Todd Roy, president there, and he takes, they'll take some groups out um, there. And I think if you're a member, it's like 10 bucks to go. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's, yeah, I think he had a group out like a month ago, mm -hmm. but most people only got, a, most groups only go out a couple of times, like Shanks Mayor, similar to me, uh, kind of like that August into September, the water's typically at its, at its lowest. And, you know, I, I always keep an eye on the weather and you can check, uh, you just kind of Google water height and it's, people get a little confused, but the water height at Holtwood, because I need to know sort of what Holtwood elevation is as opposed to what's behind safe harbor and you know i'm looking kind of for that sweet spot of 168 169 if it gets up to 170 there's going to be less to see uh of it's always going to check the water water heights so if you get a lot of rain luckily we've, we've lucked out once or twice and just missed high waters at which point you know you cancel your your trip out there because you don't a you don't want to be out there if it's dangerous and two if it's water's high there's not going to be much to see uh, out there on, on the river, but barefoot, and there are some guided tours you can get through some different people. And I think Shanks Mayor, last I checked, still had some empty spots. If people were interested, I think they, I think they still, I think they had one or two tours in, in September, and I think at least one in October, I believe. I think there was, a, yeah, Stevens. When you see these in museums, do you have to take a sponge? No, they're, I don't think they like you touching them in museums. That's how most of those places. Uh, are uh, they usually have a, a light? So uh, the light, the lighting is pretty good. So if you, the, ideally, if you can, you go out early in the morning, or you kind of go out late. Either way, when the sun is low, and so that low angle sun really helps to emphasize and, and, and see. So most of the museums usually have some nice lighting hitting it to kind of really emphasize uh, those carvings. Usually, when I get out there on tour, it's it's much later in the morning. I just don't want to get up that early. Uh, and it's like, you know, it's like pushing noon. It's, the, it, it's, it's a lot more difficult, you know, in the sponge and the water goes a long way to improve that visibility on the rock. 
Uh, yes. One, there was one question online. Have any petroglyphs been found on the York County side? Um, I I don't know how close to the shores they get. I mean, in that 27 mile stretch, I was listening to a podcast today, uh, and they were interviewing Paul Nevin, and it says like yeah, like there's like a thousand petroglyphs in that 27 mile uh, stretch, and so many of them were underwater. There might have been a time when. When maybe they were when the river was lower <laughs> before the dams, and I, that's the problem. Like there's three main concentrations. Like you had like Bald Friar, you had this walnut uh, rock up by uh, Washington Borough, and you've got I got the Safe Harbor area, and like those two are you know submerged, and most of them have been then were jackhammered out and removed. So in museums uh, for for people to you know at least kind of view it in that aspect. Um, so specifically, if there are, I, I'm unaware, but there there very well may have been. Isn't there some at the Indian Steps Museum? I, I've been there a couple times. I know they have, they have a model of Big Indian Rock. Um, if, if you've ever been there, you should check it out. It's, it's a it's a unique museum in the preservation right. style there. I don't know if they have. I don't know. I want to say maybe no, but maybe they do. Down there, and uh, the guy took us down and said, "This is a petroglyph." Right down along the water. Oh, along the water. Yeah. Okay. I didn't yeah. know that. All right, that's neat. I'll, next time I go, I'll have to ask. Yeah, I'll have to ask about that. That's that's cool. Yeah, um, that's good to know. That's really good to know. Yes. Um. So typically, like in the summer, they're they're doing that recreational depth, and that's you're usually good to go. Um, it's anywhere from like one sixty eight to like one sixty nine and change is good. One seventy. And the water just gets a little higher and there's a little less to see. But even then, you're, you're probably you're probably okay. And that's pretty much all summer long because they're just their their federal license requires them to maintain that. In the spring, early spring, winter, totally different, totally different story. I just usually check. I mean, I can usually tell if we haven't had any rain recently, we're fine. But on occasion, like if it's rained heavy in Binghamton, it takes two days for that water to get here. But if they've had a ton of rain in Binghamton, we're going to see it here as it trickles down downstream but usually that and a lot of people get confused so the river's not 168 feet deep there that they're measuring that by sea level so that's 168 feet above sea level and it's it's pretty amazing so right below safe harbor dam 168 you get on the upstream side of safe harbor and i think it's 227 uh and so it gives you an idea that elevation change in the you know the, you're using that fall in water to generate all that electricity or something like half of almost half a billion megawatts like 400 and 50 some megawatts, I think they um, reproduce there. So it's half a billion. So it's it's sizable. Anyone else? All right, well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming out. I, I really appreciate it. Sure to grab a sticker or a magnet uh, before, you, before you leave today. Thank you, Adam, that was great. And thank you all for coming out. This was one of our best turnouts for in person. So thank you, we love it. And um, our next presentation will be Greg Halpin and he'll be talking about um, the fire and York County, uh, York County Fire Departments and the fire history in York County. So thank you all for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. This was fantastic. Thank you.